Hey guys, welcome back to our channel. It's a girlfriend along go back with another reaction video. If you're new to this channel, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and of course, do not forget. To subscribe like i said my name is fanny longo and on this channel we post reaction videos each and every day so if there's something that you guys want us to react to let us know by dropping the link in the comment section below and we were more than glad to do it for you a big shout out to the person that suggested this they suggested i react to muslim history the concept the muslim history the conquest of mecca muhammad hijab so without wasting time by the way this video is going to be in two parts and yeah so without wasting time, let's get into the video. In the previous episode, we talked about the prophecies of the Quran and Sunnah relating to the Islamic expansion. And we talked about how these prophecies indicate the effectiveness of the Sharia, the Islamic law. Because a lot of those prophecies were talking about where Islam would expand to. And as we know, Islam did expand to those areas where the Prophet of Islam predicted that they would be expanded too. This facilitates a miraculous Islamic proof because the future is something which you can't really have a full authority over in the sense that you can only have a speculative relationship with it. If someone tells you something about the future or if someone's speaking about the future and they get the information right and consistently do so, this is certainly uh, something which you would ask where did they get the knowledge from to do that. Now, today we're going to be talking about the first phase of such expansion. And we're going to be doing so in relation to the Arabian Peninsula and the Islamic expansion in the Arabian Peninsula. Now, there are two verses in the Quran which particularly kind of uh, identify such expansion. Um, one of them is in chapter 24, verse 55 in Surah Al Nur, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Muslims having successions in the land. Um, and places some conditions on such succession. But another verse is in chapter number 48, verse number 27, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ الرُّؤْيَا بِالْحَقِّ That indeed Allah shall fulfill the true vision which He showed His Prophet. And this was when the Prophet had a dream, he saw a dream, that he entered Mecca along with his companions having their heads shaved and their and cut short at the same time, which of course is one of the rites of Hajj of pilgrimage. So the Prophet had this dream, and we know from the hadith and from Islamic tradition that whenever the prophets have a dream, that this is a revelation, it's a revelatory dream. So Allah continues and says, "Let al-Masjid al-Haram in Sha Allah, Aminina muhalliqina ruusakum wa muqassirina la taqafun." So Allah says in relation to this. He says, certainly shall enter Al-Masjid Al-Haram, where the Kaaba is, you know, in Mecca, if Allah wills, secure, some having um, your heads shaved and others having their head uh, cut short, having no fear. Allah says, فَعَلِمَ مَا لَمْ تَعْلَمُ And this is the amazing part here. He knew what you knew not. He knew what you knew not. فَجَعْلَ مِنْ دُونِ ذَلِكَ فَتْحًا قَرِيبًا and, grant, and he granted beside that a near victory. فَتْحًا قَرِيبًا It's also the word for conquest. فَتْح Now bear in mind, here the verse is making very specifically clear where the Fath will be. It will be in the Masjid Al-Haram. You will go into Al-Masjid Al-Haram, like where the Kaaba is. And you will perform the pilgrimage. That is a prediction. And of course, predictions like this are contingent on military success, which no one has any power over. To make such a daring prediction itself is an incredible part of the Islamic miracle. Now, you've got to remember something. In the beginning of the message of Islam, when the Prophet became a Prophet at the age of 40 and he went to the cave, Ghar Hira, and he was given revelation and then he went to his family people like Khadija his wife and so on and so forth for a very long time there was a general weakness of the Muslim a very they were weak um, uh, respective to the wider society where people were you know um, polytheists and pagans and so on and so forth in this context 
there were hostilities which graduated from gentle ridicule to open conflict. Now, for example, to take one of the most prominent examples probably in the whole of the Sirah, just to take two or three of those examples, one example of, is of Bilal ibn Rabah, who is of the slave class, a black Ethiopian individual who was being tortured and screaming at the top of his voice, Ahadun Ahad, not only that, but saying, Akfuru billahi wal uzza, wa'u'minu billah. He was saying that he disbelieves in Allah and al uzza and he believes in Allah because those individuals in that state of torture who had their economic interests at heart with the pagan, with the idols, right? They were attacking and torturing people like Bilal ibn Rabah to the point of torture, to the point where he had to scream, but he would resist such torture and proclaim his faith. Not everyone in his position did the same thing. But this was the state of the Muslims. So you imagine now, you have in the middle of a desert, an expansive desert, you have a group of people who are proclaiming a monotheism, a puritanical monotheism, who believe in this monotheism because they heard the message from this prophet who had shown them the miracles and the signs. And as a result of their proclamation of faith, they're being tortured and they're resisting this torture. There's only a few Muslims in this situation here. You have Khabbab ibn Arat, another person who was tortured. You have Ammar and Sumayya who were tortured. And we know the situation of Ammar and Sumayya. Sumayya herself who was killed. A woman who was the first martyr of Islam. And she was killed as a result of her proclaiming that she is a Muslim. Our first martyr in Islam is a woman. Yasser was killed. Ammar, his, his child, saw this. And so the state of affairs for the Muslims was incredibly weak. This is re referred to in Sirah as the Meccan period. Now when you visualize this weakness, and then you look at where Islam was, and then what it became, it's nothing short of a miraculous thing. Especially when you have such predictions as I've just recited from the Quran and showed you the implications of. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, he went, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he went to um, to Medina. Eventually, he would go to Medina, which was called Yathrib at that time, and he spoke to a group of people, Al Aus and Khazraj, and there were six people who initially became Muslim, and then you had something called Bayatul Aqaba, which literally was a pledge of allegiance which was of, maybe you could say, um, 12 individuals in total. The first Bayat al-Aqaba was of 12 individuals. And it had in it, you know, conditions of never to commit shirk or polytheism and not to commit lewdness, uh, fornication, and not to steal and not to kill your children and so on and so forth. Solidarity in this case was based on religious and not tribal lines. And this is one of the turning points in all of not just Islamic history but human history and this is something really interesting because Fred McGraw Donner says the following he says the formation of a state in the Arabian Peninsula and ideological i.e. religious coherence and mobilization was a primary reason why the Muslim armies in the space of a hundred years were able to establish the largest pre-modern empire until that time now this is incredible because the main thing here is that Islam was established on, as McGraw says, religious and not tribal lines. And so this solidarity which would be based on the Iman of the Muslim and not of the tribal lineage or genealogy of the Muslim is what really changed the game. The tables were not going to turn, the tables had already turned at this stage because all of history had been defined by this metaphysical phase. Because if you think about it all, what did the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, actually offer Al Aws al Khazraj, who would then become the you know the, the military conquerors of all of Arabia and a large part of the pre modern world? He offered them a metaphysical promise, a metaphysical promise of Jannah, of heaven. And from this metaphysical promise, all physical things came about. All physical success came about, which gives us a lesson. The lesson is 
the lesson is for us to have trust in the metaphysical because from that trust in the metaphysical everything that you want in the physical reality will take place just like Bilal ibn Rabah gives us a lesson as we'll come to know or see because him shouting out and screaming out in his loudest of voices at a time of severe humiliation for the Muslims Ahadun Ahad meaning one and only one and only referring to the one and only God that is being worshipped would translate into him being able to do so at a time of strength as we'll come to see so in about 6 AH the pagans uh, and the Muslims the, sorry the Muslims wanted to do a pilgrimage and the pagans stopped the Muslims from being able to do so now you've got to understand when the Medinan period took place and the Prophet Muhammad was in Medina for 10 years scholars of Sirah of the biography of the Prophet Muhammad say that there were about 19 Ghazawat Ghazawat are major wars you could say there are different definitions of what a Ghazwa is but if you think about 19 that's an average of almost two a year some years obviously had more and some years had less but when people think about the Prophet's motivations and question the Prophet's motivation وسلم, they've got to realize that his life was one of warfare and it's true maybe not in the Orientalist way that is trying to be portrayed by some right-wing individuals because most of those in fact you could even argue all of those 19 were defensive but very interesting um, video with very educational information I always love things that take me back to the past so that I can understand things um, I like the fact that he made mention of how Islam was formed not based on tribe but rather religion itself, nothing else. I feel like tribe separates a lot of people. Many things separate separate people but tribe, tribe is wicked because every other tribe wants to be better than the other one. But if you can unite and put those differences aside, then you're winning in life. Otherwise, let me get to the second part of this. 